You can stand, stand. If not, don't. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. I pledge allegiance to the local church and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're thankful for uh, you allowing us to be here still in a free country. Pray to be with the Gruns here in Boston, Emily with the hockey, and be with Richard uh, in the uh, therapy place, Father. Uh, watch over our people. And, and uh, Patricia and uh, April in Jesus name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. <clears throat> Preaching on the book. I don't know how long it's going to be this study, but the uh, material is endless. And uh, I'll even make you sit there and I'll probably read a few pages today. Uh, hopefully that uh, you'll get it in your brain. A lot of these things that we've been teaching <clears throat> thus far uh, we basically have been talking about inspiration uh, what double inspiration is and um, how the Bible no way no shape has ever used the word originals or even considered that a doctrine but what they the Bible does talk about is God's speech his speaking his words and using people to record his words people forget stuff they, they when, when you get into technical stuff like manuscript evidence and things like this everything that you read even the commentaries that I have in my office honest men honest conservative men uh, I think the fellow's name is Schaaf uh, out of uh, Texas uh, um, theology school there uh, and uh, he's got a set of commentaries I think I think are excellent uh, he does use etymological studies you know the Greek or whatever he's what we call a uh, Texas receptus man uh, that is goes by the majority of the texts not those few that they think are older and uh, and he also believes in moderate dispensation in other words the Jew the Gentile and the church and, and a lot of things you can get out of that. And, uh, but still, there's points where they just forget about God. Uh, what do you mean about God? Does God know where his word is? Duh, right? If you know who God is, he's everywhere. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. So you've got to start from the premise that he's God. And if he's God and he claims, God claims, okay, and God's not a liar. He claims that he's going to preserve his word perfect. And it was in, you know, in the Psalms there from that generation forever. So we know that God said that he will protect his word. We know that. And we know from his word that when he speaks, he calls that scripture. Scripture. Throughout the <laughs> Go to Greek, go to Hebrew, whatever. It's scripture. And uh, just like the Jews, they... They have a whole system, the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are to keep the Word of God. They're like Bible believers back in the day. And uh, I, once again, I hear a lot of the brethren always condemning people, you know, and actually condemning the Pharisees, you know, the organization the, uh, that God uh, uh, has something to do with. I was saying, well, the problem was these Bible believers let it go to their head that they were above God. They were above acting like they were supposed to act that God told them how to act what to do and that's why throughout the scriptures you'll have some Pharisees are good Nicodemus was a smart man right came to the Lord at night that's where you get the being born again uh, scriptures from him and uh, but a lot of them felt threatened by the Lord uh, because all the attention was taken off of them in their position 
And so then they go after the Lord. And they're trying to uh, bring him down to their level and beyond so that the people would stop following him. Well, the problem is, he's God manifest in the flesh, knew what they were thinking, knew what they were doing, and at every turn, he would go and do something stupid, like heal somebody on the Sabbath day, right? Even though the Lord already told me when you go to the Old Testament that if your ox is in the, you know, there's, there's provisions for that. So here he heals somebody, makes them better, and right away the Pharisees, these Pharisees, try to do what? Deal with them, kill them, do whatever they can to them to try to bring reproach on them, and they couldn't do it. So when you look at the Word of God, if you were going to say the devil is our enemy, and uh, you would look throughout history and see what the devil tried to do. So from Genesis, right, in the garden, he said uh, to Eve, what? hath God said, right? As soon as he said that, he was casting a doubt on what Eve said that God said. She wasn't supposed to take of that fruit. And then he went through his whole thing about correcting the word of God. And uh, a big word in Genesis, we're, we're going to probably get to that, but uh, not today, but uh, with Eve is the fact that she removed the word freely given. And so you start to see all these things all the way from the garden when they sinned and how the devil's plan was to ruin the word of God, twist the root of God, word of God. And people think that the devil don't know the word of God. He knows the word of God. He knew the word of God ever since uh, God said that uh, this man child was going to crush his head. The heel of his foot was going to crush his, the serpent's head in Genesis 3. He, knew, he knows who he is. He is and who his enemy is and so uh, just like we preached before and taught before ever since the garden he was in preparation to stop the Lord from coming that was his whole deal so then finally you got the Lord coming this Christmas season right and uh, he couldn't stop that so what does he do You, you, you remember this, you know, after I'm dead. But when you go to the book of Acts, you're going to find out several persecutions, correct? When you go through, everybody's against that church starting. Everybody's against the believers. The Jews are in Jerusalem. And what the devil's noticed is this, is whenever he persecutes God's people, he doesn't get rid of them. He doesn't get rid of them. What happens to them? They multiply. They multiply. What do you mean? He's killing them off, and instead of them afraid, they're emboldened. It's like they start to multiply. You say you got an example of that? Yeah. USA. United States of America. The king tried keeping everybody down by persecution, taxes, and everything. What happened? Old farmers started getting wind of it. Okay, now here we are since 1776, and, and uh, we got a problem in this country. I, I really believe that the enemy of this country thought they could easily get us under like they did in Australia. But surprise, things are starting to backfire. And I don't know about you, but it's sort of positive. There's people that aren't even saved, but they're just charactered people, know our history, that are coming out of the woodwork, names I never even heard of with lawsuits, fighting this, doing this, and you say, what's happening? Well, all of a sudden, under pressure, people that are doing right and know what right is, they get emboldened and start to... And then what happens with the Christian? Well, if you lose your life, you'll gain it. Christian starts to understand, hey, if I die, all they can do is kill me. I'm going to heaven anyway. And man, you're emboldened by that. What does that mean? They can't put fear in you. But back then, the power of God was real. The church is starting. We're talking thousands being saved with Peter there in Jerusalem. First one was it 3,000, second 2,000. I mean, so here's the devil thinking he's going to stop the church by persecution. Okay? So now he's watching this and trying to stop it. He uses religion. He uses the Pope to kill I don't know how many in the probably 50 million 
is what I heard in the Inquisition. Fifty million. Well, you got proof of that? Well, we got Trail of Blood booklet that, that documents all the Waldensians, Huguenots, Perversions, the different names of groups, and those that had a Bible, and the Pope said nobody can have the Bible unless you're, you went through the priesthood, you went through the seminary, because uh, it conf it's confusing, and the church is the one that decides what scripture is. So you had to deal with all that. Well, who's working through that, devil? And so now, next thing you know, you got the uh, Church of England pulls out, starts their own religion, but they kept all that persecution. And then you got some pilgrims leaving, right? They weren't called pilgrims then. But you got a group of people leaving Holland, come over here. So they And this country was going great until probably 1720, because 1620 was what, the Mayflower? Yeah, was, was rock, was the rock, the plantation. Plymouth Rock. And uh, so we have people here that wanted God to lead and wanted to be ruled by the Bible. And they set it up. And it wasn't just until before they wanted to be like Europe education wise. So we brought teachers from there over here. When you see the devil knows he cannot persecute the church spirit. So he has to cause doubt. Causing confusion. He caused confusion because remember he's the author of confusion. If everybody has one of these and they're different, you know, whatever your preference. And somebody says, let's get up in unison and repeat this verse. Can't do it anymore in most churches. And everybody thinks they got something. But everybody doesn't really believe in their heart that they got it all. And everybody in their heart thinks, well, I'm not smart enough to know it. Therefore, I go to church where the guy knows Greek and Hebrew, and he can teach me because that's what pastors are supposed to do is lead the flock. And there's a lot of them conservative, and they're doing a fine job, and even some with the NIV. But that person in the pew's got to know that they have the Bible. And they can understand it. And that God in them can lead them through this book. And when they open it up, they don't have to say, well, I wonder if that's really what it means. You're doubting everything about even what you're reading. If God could possibly talk to your heart and show you something. You don't have that there because you're not qualified, you see. Somebody sold you that bill. <laughs> and so we're here as Bible believers now always been here but since the arguments arose and the doubts and the chaos and since colleges now like even the one I went to promote the Greek not to substantiate the King James Bible but to find fault in it and for you to correct it because you can do it so in the last days what the devil is doing and all this big old spiel that I'm giving you right now is to show you that he cannot persecute us out. He can't do it. Just can't do it. Sorry. But he can cause doubt. And once he causes doubt, guess what? You no longer have that faith that you need for this book. And so you're running around like everybody else. And what does that mean? You can be led, led astray. And that's why the Bible says that there's folks out there that are deceiving because they're deceived. And... Uh, so when I come and I give you outlines and you borrow brains, right? You can always borrow brains. I'll seek out outlines. Good. And so when we went through this Bible, we noticed that the term scripture in the scriptures is never referenced to any original autograph. And we showed you, we showed you the verses there. And, uh, also, if you remember, we went from that to uh, uh, the next thing was no translation can be inspired. Uh, what was that all about? Well, what they're saying is, yeah, God preserved the, the words, right? But they weren't inspired. Now, you've got to follow the logic here. If you believe what they believe about the originals, you have to believe that copies are not inspired. 
They believe they're originals when God originally spoke and that those verses were inspired by God, but everything else was preservation and not inspiration. And those guys are hard to find, but they're more like on our level with the King James. At least that they're going to hold that King James up. But behind the scenes, they, they believe it's the originals. So they come across a guy like me. They call us hillbillies or whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're so stupid, you don't know. Listen, when God originally spoke that, that's when they were inspired, Bob. Come on. But we know who God is. He can preserve it. So whatever he preserves, not inspired. And so that's why we went through the scriptures and we showed you the fallacy of that. Because, like in Jeremiah, when he spoke, that was the originals. Then the king went and burnt up the scriptures. So Jeremiah got those scriptures and God says and he added some to it so were they inspired sure they were all scriptures inspired the Bible says believe in that you see you're gonna be a Bible believer what do you mean that means wherever you go you got the Holy Spirit in here this is an inspired book by the Holy Spirit of God these are the words of God so if the you had was a Bible and you were a little confused your faith would say this well this is God's word surely he's God he can speak to me you grab that book go in the corner somewhere go hide somewhere in the woods or whatever and you start to read that and that Bible will feed you spiritually and when you start to get that connection nobody can take that from you that's why sometimes we get mean Bible believers are all so mean cantankerous you're messing with the book and you're teaching people that there's a hierarchy. That unless you go to college and learn the scriptures, well, man, that sounds like the Catholic Church back in the Dark Ages. Exactly. Unless you go to seminary and learn that, you cannot know the whole Word of God. It's just junk. Never was intended that way. The schools that started, Yale, Princeton, Harvard, was to get these people that were uneducated, educated, to present the Word of God without just going to the Word of God like this and just spitting stuff out. I mean, could you imagine somebody preach a whole sermon on Judas, went out and hung himself? You know, maybe the guy in his mind thought that that meant that everybody out here that, that ever deceived God or went against God, y'all ought to just go out and hang yourself. And then he goes in verses. Then people go out and hang themselves. You say, surely no, surely yes. There's been people that come to this book that don't know how to rightly divide it, that don't understand when it says scripture. You, you find all the verses on your topic. That's why no uh, scriptures of any private interpretation. And you'll find all that in here. You'll, f you'll find the rules on how to understand this book in this book. You'll find the definition of words in this book. You don't even need Webster's. Now, are you totally confused? Hope not. I'm just trying to show you from all the verses that we saw, going from, uh, and you're talking about languages now. And if you remember, we went uh, uh, with the languages. You say, what do you mean? Moses knew Hebrew, but he was raised as what? An Egyptian. Right? Sure. Talked Egyptian, spoke Egyptian. So you can find verses in there that are in our Old Testament that the Mesoraic text, which is Hebrew, right, translates Egyptian into the Hebrew so that you know. And God even leaves some names in here, even in Revelation, like Apollyon and stuff like this, that are Greek words because they're names, they mean something, and expects you to define them. You can define them from the book. So... What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying when it's all done, you're either going to be totally confused or you're going to be totally convinced that when you leave this place, this thing is the Word of God. Matter of fact, at night when you get bad dreams and things get spooky, you may even open up the book and set it on your mantle. You say, come on. I, say, I know what I'm talking about. I just had so much faith that this is the Word of God, so when I'm not doing right and not being right or I'm thinking something bad's going on, I just open it up. 
Let them devils deal with this. This is a live book. Very alive. It's God's book. So, the last thing that we left off with was this double inspiration, and we went through a bunch of uh, different scriptures, and uh, I want to reiterate that, but uh, we did show you that the following original autographs, like they claim in Greek, were translations of the Hebrew, and we went through the Gospels and showed you that, and uh, went to the book of Acts, went to Romans, uh, doing what? Showing you the Old Testament, how it was taken from the Old Testament, put in the New Testament. And uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 we covered. We covered Acts 8.32 and 2 Timothy 4.2. And these were the questions, and we, we, what we can do is we will hit some of those scriptures. Did the scribes, those are the people that copied, right? And the Pharisees, those people that kept them, have the first copy that Moses wrote? Did they have the first copy that Moses ever wrote? How about did they have Isaiah's first copy? No. Never, never, the only thing you'll find in the Bible is they had scripture. The word scripture is used. You don't know if they had the originals or copies of the original, original, originals. I would assume that the Bible when God put the scriptures out there, if they're being read, they're being wore out. And that's some of the arguments against Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and Alexandrinus, the three main manuscripts that the Catholic Church uses, uh, how they were found. And when you find out how they were found, like Sinaiticus was found in the garbage can, garbage can, in a monastery on Mount Sinai, garbage can. Listen, if it's the real word of God, you're going to find it in a prominent place somewhere. And if you find the real word of God back then in manuscript parchment form, it's going to be almost wore out. They had to keep making copies because they were being read. So if you find a bunch of them that ain't been touched and you're claiming those, that comes under a suspicion because the Texas Receptus is over 5,000 different manuscripts. And uh, you go through them, wore out, and there was copies because the copier always puts his initials on the bottom. And that makes sense. If I go in your library, if you have one, and I look through all your books, I can tell which one was being read more, right? The one that's getting more out. So anybody that had the word of God, especially back in those days, precious, uh, it would have been wore out. So when I throw these things at you, later on when we're going through uh, the manuscripts, some of this stuff will pop up in your brain. And the problem is a lot of times people leave church before they don't get all this stuff together, and so I'm the crazy one. Now down the line, they're gonna find out that that teaching, how that's being taught, you know, how you put it out there and forget, put it out there and forget. Third time you put something out there, you don't forget. So as a teacher, even as you as a parent, you will do certain things with your children that they may not know right then, but they'll pick up on it later. Sometimes you gotta have a stimulus, a little whooping every now and then to make that and ensure that. So go to 2 Timothy 3.16 so we don't forget that one. 2 Timothy 3.16. Now we have books by uh, Brother Grady. He's got a good one uh, that was like a standard actually for a lot of colleges even uh, on the King James issue and the manuscripts. Uh, we'll probably uh, get into that too. Uh, most of the things that I have learned uh, were either from Dr. Peter S. Sturgis Rugman or people that have read his stuff and complimented it with maybe more chapters or whatever, but uh, it's out there. Sam Gipp, uh, tons of people that have brought things down to our level. Second Timothy 3. All right. And verse 16. See, they don't, if, if, this is what it says, all right? It says, all scripture is given. Do you see that? Is given. That means it was given. Scripture was given. How was it given? By inspiration of God. And it's what? It's profitable for doctrine. That's the first thing is doctrine. Was that teaching? 
teaching. For reproof, that's negative, isn't it? Sure it is. And what else? For correction, that's negative. And for instruction in righteousness. So that Bible comes on people strong because it's against man's flesh. It's going to be negative. And to understand uh, the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God, like for us, for the church age, that's getting into doctrine, that's teaching. And you're going to find it all in the what? Scriptures. And the Bible was given. See that? All Scripture is given by inspiration. Now, here's the thing with the, well, I call them perversions, but the other one, you know what they got? That was given. So now you leave it open to who? Somebody saying, I get to choose what scripture is inspired just by changing that direct object. When you start getting in there, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, period. Not for me to pick which ones were inspired by God. If you see the loophole there, that's why they took that off, that, that direct. Uh, all scripture is given. Not all scripture that was given. When you see that was given, then that opens up things for somebody to ask the question, well, which scripture was that that was given? Little subtle stuff like that. And the guy will say, well, come to my Greek class and I'll show you. And that's how we got that circular reasoning. Again. And, and so this, all, I'm, all I'm trying to say is that scripture alone right there tells you that all scripture is inspired to God. Okay, all scripture. And we go, we got Philip and Ethia. We need to understand that also, you think about, did Timothy have David's original autograph of Psalms 2? No. How about Psalms 23 or Psalms 110? Did Paul give Timothy Malachi's originals or Jeremiah? What are you saying? All these fellas right here, when you go into the Bible, in the, in the, in the, uh, the you know, Timothy, uh, the Thessalonians, you go to any of these books, you're going to find Scripture in them and it's going to be taken from the Old Testament account. So what you're saying is all these other books right here that have the same scripture cannot be inspired because that would be considered dual or double inspiration. That's why it's a fallacy and it's false. That's junk. All scripture is given by inspiration. So it was given in, when God gave it in the Old Testament, when Paul used the Old Testament scriptures that were there, there were copies and copies and copies of originals, but they were inspired. And God used them, uh, used Paul to pin them down in the latter part of Acts there. And you get into Romans all the way to Philemon. And then how about James and how about Peter and all these people that are quoting from the Old Testament? Is it, is, isn't that double inspiration according to them? Sure it is. They're, they're just messed up. They haven't thought all the way through. What they're trying to do is corner the market on telling us what the truth is. And that's why they go to languages that nobody understands. They're dead languages, ancient languages, and uh, we got a problem. So then the next thing, uh, down the line, we're going to move in and say, well, why is the King James English better since it's archaic, you see? All these questions are going to come up. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna answer them. Yes, we are. Uh, go to Acts chapter 8. Now, we'll get to that Philip uh, and the Ethiopian eunuch and show you that what you have is you have a black fella from Africa that is a Jewish proselyte from Queen Candace. No doubt goes back to Solomon, because remember Sheba? Remember the black queen that came and uh, Solomon ended up marrying her? And uh, so that influence was in Africa. And some people think out of all the tribes in Af Africa, you know, the Watusi, the Tutus, and all these other tribes, the closest one to the Bible is the Zulu tribe. And I don't know how many of you watched the old movie, Chaka Zulu, Zulu Chaka or something, but way back when uh, Britain tried taking them over, it was the Zulus that put them down. And when they went to their culture, they found out that they had like the Ten Commandments. And uh, I mean, for adultery, they'd kill you. I mean, they had some, they had some biblical laws in there in Africa. And they're not stupid. And today, uh, Zulu Nation is pretty heavily educated and uh, populated. And so you can only, only I just uh, believe that it goes all the way back because God blesses those 
that uh, had heard him, that fear him. And through Queen uh, of Ethiopia, uh, Candace here we find in, in Acts, we got a proselyte coming after the day of, after Pentecost. He's coming from Jerusalem. He is reading uh, the book of Isaiah, I believe. And over here in Acts chapter 8 and uh, verse 32. 8 and verse 32. The Bible says, The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before the shearer, so opened he not his mouth. So now, we're a modern day person, and we know that's Isaiah 53, that he was reading. So here we got a black Jewish proselyte reading from the scriptures. And remember, the date of my book here is like 31 AD, and Isaiah was written around 750. So we know that it's a copy of copies. So we don't play that original stuff. We believe he had scriptures, just like the Bible said where he was reading. He, they never questioned, well, let's see, he was reading from the book of Isaiah, but it wasn't the originals. No. Everything is matter, matter of factly when you start reading the Bible, that whoever had scriptures believed it to be the very inspired word of God. And we never got any doubts from that throughout all the books. And therefore, we conclude that it's not the originals, but it's God's word, whether it be copies of copies of copies or translations going to another language. God's word is inspired. So at any rate, we see in 32, and we know in Isaiah 53 is the scriptures, uh, and we'll read on. 33 says, In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And 34, this is what the eunuch says. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? So he's got a good question. This guy's coming along. He's going to take everybody's sin upon him. He's going to do all this stuff. And who is this man? And God sent Philip to do what? To interpret that scripture for the Ethiopian eunuch. And uh, so we see in 35, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him who? Jesus. Preached unto him Jesus. Well, how could he interpret? Listen, Philip was saved. What happened? A resurrection. All they had was the Old Testament scripture. But when 53 was read, all those Jews that got saved knew exactly who that was because that's how you get saved. Somebody had to take your sins. It wasn't the works of the law, works of their righteousness. It was this man. Who was that man? Jesus. And so we see in, in, in 36... And as they went on their way, now this is after Philip told them who the guy was that did all this, they came on to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? You say, why? Well, because the Jew believes, like, like with John the Baptist, they, they get cleansed from their sin when they bring their works, you know, proof of their repentance that they're cleansed by the baptismal waters. And so here you got a Jew, read the scriptures, the Holy Spirit's telling them that somebody took his sins, the penalty of his sins away. So immediately he found out it was Jesus from Philip. He sees the water, right? And so right away he, he feels like what? I gotta get baptized, okay? Now here's a, Here's the deal that most, most of these other Bibles, they take this other verse out or they put it in the footnote. Not in the original languages, not in... Anyway. He says in 36, what does hinder me? Now look at, in verse 37, it's key because this is how we get saved. And Philip said, if thou believest, look what it says, with all thine heart thou mayest. Oh, now I have to believe before I'm baptized? Yeah. That's exactly what it means. And that's why they don't, they don't like this verse. They take it out, I'm telling you. Or they'll put a footnote. Why would they do that? 
Philip said, If thou believest, with all thine heart thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. My goodness. That's what you believed. You got saved. What's happening to the eunuch? He got saved. <laughs> Look at 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit, capital S, of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. What are you saying? I'm saying it's amazing how you can check out all the other Bibles by those verses. Why would somebody want to hide the fact that uh, in order to get baptized scripturally, you have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ first? Those that believe that baptism has something to do with your salvation. Catholic Church, some Episcopals, gets rid of original sin, that baby. And see, this puts a damper on everything. This is what caused all those people dying in the Inquisition. These were people that believed you had to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ before you're baptized. So when people would get saved during the Dark Ages, they would baptize them. The Catholic Church said they were heretics because they were already baptized by the Catholic Church as babies that took away original sin and therefore were committing damnation to these people. And they'd kill them. But Scripture teaches that you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And after that, baptism is an act of outward expression of what has already happened. When you died with Christ, you went under the water, and when you, you come up out of that water, you rose with Christ, and you're to walk in newness of life. So you see, if a simple verse that a young Christian hasn't got to yet in whatever uh, they call their Bible or whatever, when they come to that story, if, those, if that verse is missing, they may not think it's a big deal. But later on when they find out that they had to be saved before they got baptized, and here's a verse that doesn't support that, it just goes right into baptism. And uh, so that's just one of them. Second Timothy 4.2. We're talking about double inspiration. I'm showing you that Philip... And the Ethiopian eunuch had copies of copies. Second Timothy 4.2, famous verse. The Bible says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their, uh, and that's First Timothy. That's a good one, but that's not the one. Second Timothy 4.2. Here's what the Bible says. Preach the word. If it says preach the word, you must have the word, correct? All logical here. Be instant in season. Okay, that means everybody's receiving the book. And out of season. Everybody's not receiving the book. <laughs> they don't want to hear it. And, and what, is, what are we doing here? Reproving. Really? Rebuke. So we got two negatives again. Right away, when you're going to look in the Bible, you know, everybody's, oh, positive, positive. Your church is so negative. Everything in this Bible shows you God emphasizes the negative first. There's certain things that have to be lined up before you can enjoy something. And people don't like that. You see, they, they got itching ears. They want to feel good about themselves. And when you get in the King James Bible, it's showing you how bad your flesh is. I mean, who wants to be told how bad they are? Nobody. But a person that recognizes that had to, that finally recognizes that the only way they get saved is what Jesus has done, not them. It's not their works of righteousness. You're not the good guy here. Jesus Christ is good. Only God is good. Jesus Christ is good. You are not. So here you get saved on that fact. And that's how you live. So when that Bible comes to you and it, it, it points out your heart, your thoughts, your evil ways, and you don't just throw it away, cut it out, or get, a, get some book that's nice. You say to yourself, that's absolutely right. God is right. He put his finger right on the problem. Then what do you do? You ask the Lord to help you not to do that. You tell him you're sorry. And you go on. That's the book. But I'm telling you, if the, if the devil can come and make doubt on the book, then it messes up your communication with God. And then you'll go by your feelings 
and your emotions. Anybody who's ever did anything for the Lord or even in life had to suffer all sorts of things if you look at their biographies before they achieved something. So here in 2 Timothy we see that. And many verses that show you this double inspiration, triple inspiration. Are you understand a little bit of this, I hope? And, and like I say, when you have questions scripturally, uh, just write them down or something, and uh, I'll definitely, uh, you know, take them by scripture. Um, got to remember, I think you haven't, you haven't got a copy of the uh, double inspiration yet. Um, you got the scripture, you got the original autographs, yeah. Okay, because I don't want to pass out the third time to you since you already have that. Let me see. I'm going to have to make more copies for you guys next week. I'll leave that on top. So if you keep these, at least you'll... At least you'll know. Now, let me get to my notes if I can find them. And also, you'll get some uh, handouts that uh, we won't have to cover a lot, like the 20th century hypocrisy among conservatives and fundamentalists. And uh, I've got a list here. The following operations were carried out by all the translators of every so-called reliable English translation of the 20th century. And th this goes through with the rules and where they come from. Uh, American Standard Version, New American Standard Version, New International Version, uh, New Reverse standard version or, or revised standard version, etc., and uh, gives you the dates when they come out and what manuscripts that they used. And black and white, simple. So if you have a folder somewhere, one day you're just perusing, you can go through it again. And uh, I'm trying to figure out how to get, uh, we either get us a new uh, copier because I think this one is messing up in my office now, leaving marks, so. Now, Dr. Herbert Noe uh, was my pastor, and uh, he uh, put out a booklet, too, uh, you know, Seven Reasons Why I Know That the King James Bible is the Only Word of God in English Language. I will s tell you this, that he never claimed to be a scholar, but he taught Greek, taught English, my pastor, at Bob Jones University. And he believed everything they said about no double inspiration, he believed the originals, and he got a set of tapes by Dr. Ruckman on manuscript evidence. So this is all technical stuff, you know, where this manuscript came from, what part of age, all the, you know, going through the whole thing. And he listened to that, taking Neva, I think it was Neva at the time, down to school, and listened to him on the way back. And when he came back, you know what he was? A Bible believer. He says, that's it. He I've been searching all my life thinking there's something weird about not having the, all the Word of God and that God's going to use me, you know, in whatever, 1980 or 60 to make my own manuscript copies and, you know, claim that to be as, as preserved as anything else. But anyway, uh, he came to the conclusion of that, and that's what blew a lot of people's minds because here you have somebody with degreed like that that went through Bob Jones and was contrary to them. And what people don't know is Dr. Peter Sturgis Ruckman got a PhD, earned PhD from Bob Jones University. They don't like to claim him, but he does. And uh, so God raised up some people asking questions in Greek class and Hebrew class that instructors could not answer but only got mad. In other words, how dare you question me? I'm the authority, right? And so these people went and investigated, and they come to some conclusions and they ended up being Bible believers. Amen. So, in Psalms 12, 6 and 7, the Bible says this, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Uh, Psalms 12, 6 and 7. And uh, the first reason why he believes uh, that uh, he's got the book 
is the miracle of its composition. Composition. What's it com comprise? Now, one of the main reasons given for all the new Bibles is supposedly because the King James Bible has archaic words and because the English language has changed. Not so. King James Bible was composed at the height of the purity of the English language, and it has been the one purifying force as corruptors of our language have modernized it. We do not need to update our language. In fact, one of the best ways to find the real meaning of a difficult word in the King James Bible is not to go to a modern version uh, that waters it down or renders it with some modern English word, but look it up in an ar the archaic meaning in a good English dictionary. It's there. Gustav Payne, in his book, The Men Behind the King James Version, states on page 168, to know that the Bible words were beyond the choosing of the best of them. We have only to look at their individual writing. In other words, they put the Bible in English that they were not capable of writing. That's a miracle in itself of composition. They put the Bible in English. So what about the composition of the book of Isaiah, which naturally falls into 66 chapters with a distinct division between chapter 39 and 40. Isaiah was a model of the entire Bible centuries before it was finished. Before it was finished. In other words, right now I'm lifting this book up. We're teaching Isaiah. It has 66 chapters, like 66 books of the Bible. It starts in the beginning, like Genesis. It ends with a new heaven, new earth, and everything in between. And when you go to 39 and 40, guess what? There's a man crying in the wilderness. Who's that? John the Baptist. Shows you the Bible set up before the Bible was even put together. See, these things aren't taught. They ought to be. These are miracles. So what about, you know, you think about that. So it is not, it is not significant that the center verse of the King James Bible is it not significant? You know, Isaiah or, or Psalm 118.8 and the center words of that verse are the Lord. Now, that's not true of other Bibles uh, that delete part of Mark or 1 John 5, 7, etc. You know, with the Trinity. The Lord is the center of the King James Bible. It is his Bible. He put it together. So let us look at one example of how the words in the King James Bible are more accurate when compared to the modern renderings. In 1 Timothy 6, 20, it says in our King James Bible, avoiding what? Oppositions of what? Science falsely so-called. Now, in the New Schofield Bible, science is rendered knowledge. Therefore, they took science out and put knowledge in. All right? You find that interesting? Yeah. Now, how did the King James translators know that science with its insane evolution and other attacks on the Bible and faith would be such a problem in our day. How could the new Schofield editors be so oblivious that they got rid of the truth? Knowledge says absolutely nothing in the context, if you read the context of that verse. It's about science falsely called. And in the 1600s, you know, you start getting to Galileo, you start getting all that stuff, you had to at least believe in God all them discoveries were done by people that believed in a deity. But down the line, guess what was going to happen? Science was going to be falsely called that. Why? Because they were getting rid of God. My Bible already had it in there. Uh, you say, well, yeah. Number two, the majesty of its language. I talked to Ben that was across the street. He moved. He was educated, going to college. I said, well, I can't answer a lot of things intellectually like you probably want so you need to go to uh, 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 that fellow Jeremiah not David um, uh, the Indian fellow yeah Zacharias I'm sorry Zacharias and uh, uh, David he's got good stuff but Zacharias that, that's his whole purpose was to go to the Yale Prince and all that stuff well, the fellow must have did it because he didn't want to talk to me about it no more. So God raises people up is what I'm saying to uh, uh, blow the mind of people that think they got it together with no God. No, there's a God, that's for sure. So what's cool about our King James Bible is this. It's plain. It's plain. Even blunt when necessary. When describing Babylon, which is the mother of harlots, 
She is called the great whore, not a prostitute. That is clear, don't you think? Uh, yeah. Prostitute would be like a, a nicer term than you whore. But I guess our King James Bible calls her that. Sure does. Yet when describing Mary's condition, listen to me. And we'll be, that'll probably be this morning maybe. But when, when uh, describing Mary's condition before the birth of Jesus, it does not say pregnant with modern bluntness. Instead it says she was great with child. I mean, how majestic. How could it be better said? And then how crude is the Living Bible? There's a Living Bible, right? With its uh, SOB in 1 Samuel 20 and 30 and its description of Baal out going to the toilet when, when uh, uh, the Baal priests were trying to call fire from heaven in the contest with Elijah. Talk about crude and rude. and uh, That was supposed to be part of Taylor's thing too for all the kids to read. SOBs in there and all anyway that living Bible right the majestic language of the King James Bible is threaded throughout conversation and literature of English speaking people I mean who quotes any other Bible but a King James Bible when they're not aware of uh, where their quotes originated uh, Wade and wanting that's King James you know Wade and wanting how about in the twinkling of an eye you heard that before a house divided against itself etc are expressions used by news commentaries, sportcasters, and all other public speakers. I have yet to hear or read such an expression from another Bible unless it was some corrector deliberately butchering the pure majestic word of God. Listen to the difference in these verses. Quote, As for me, brothers, when I came to you, I declared the attested truth of God without display of fine words of wisdom. End of quote. Now, we'll do this verse again. Quote, And I, brethren, excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Now, the first is from the New English Bible. And, of course, the second is from the King James Bible. I never heard anyone address Christians as brothers, brother, to one, but brethren, to more. And that's because it's in the King James Bible. Some people think, oh, that's just little stuff. Yeah. Third thing, and uh, we'll uh, end with the third point here. The uh, uh, malignity of its enemies. You can determine the character of a person by who hates him. In the same way, you can define the character of the King James Bible. Westcott and Hort hated, hated this Bible and the Greek text behind it, and their work is re revered by all Bible correctors today. Bible correctors are the enemies of God's word, whether they think they are or not. Not only are they enemies, but they are followers of the champion of the first corrector, according to Genesis 3.1, is where he first appeared saying this, Yea, hath God said. Who said that? The devil. The steps of Bible apostasy that take over every church or school, Christian organization, and preacher are outlined for us in our inspired Bible. Really? Yeah. First, God's word is questioned, according to Genesis 3.1. Young people go away to Christian schools, having been saved by believing the Bible. There they learn to question it by listening to Bible-correcting professors. Secondly, the words of God are retranslated. How about Genesis 3, 2 to 3? Eve was on the first translation committee in cooperation with the devil. Note that her correction of God's words was to make it say what she wanted it to instead of what it actually said. It was not even cl a close translation. And maybe we'll go back and, or you can read Genesis 3, 2 to 3, and see where it wasn't part of God's instructions. Now the devil cooperating <laughs> translations have become more subtle today in the new Schofield, the new King James, etc. Eve left out freely, which denied God's grace, how very instructive there. How the devil and man hate God's pure grace. She also added touch and changed surely to lust. Hmm. Thirdly, the Bible is denied. Eve became completely obedient to the devil instead of God. That is where Christ-denying, Bible-hating liberals have taken our world 
today with the cooperation of new evangelicals, new Bible, new fundamentalists, they have quit teaching people to proclaim God's word and have taught them to be intellectuals that correct it. It is one great big devil inspired movement to rid the world of the King James Bible so that the Antichrist can take over. And uh, we'll leave it there and we'll pick it up at the fourth one, which is the message to the common man. So we'll take a few.